Every day, you essentially pay your dues by doing the harder thing when it's the right thing to do. Nick, what's up, man? <laughs> We're just so <laughs> casual now. <laughs> how are you doing, David? Dude, I'm good, man. Uh, I've lost track of how many times in the podcast. We got to be at least five. You have like the crown, the crown jewel of all five. I don't know. Um, yeah, man. I actually, I'm filming a bunch of podcasts today. We were talking about four, and I'm pumped because all the people on the podcast, not that I love talking to everybody and new people too, but they're all people I'm familiar with. I know well. It's like kind of catching up with old friends. So it's kind of like an excuse for me just to like, hang with everybody and like oh yeah gymnastic stuff like that's cool too <laughs> but that's where i'm at this morning <laughs> this is my- your social life isn't it basically <laughs> no, the, the shift I- show is just forced <laughs> i know what your diary's like if you don't put something in the diary for social time you won't do it so this is basically your your social time <laughs> i am proud to say that my hobby game has been strong in the last six to eight months so i've been pretty good yeah but uh, this is definitely I am a social person, so this is a very helpful way to cheat and get both <laughs> it's yeah. like content and i get to like learn stuff i interviewed um uh somebody who was maybe tom or someone but like if someone i was like really wanting to talk to about strength and conditioning for a while anyways and it like happened to coordinate our schedules where it was a podcast and this and i just like i like barely talked i was like this is great it's like a free like lecture this is fantastic mm. so there's nothing better when it threads the needle like seven times where you can kind of get the most out of it love it but uh you of course uh have been on before many times and i think we've had some on culture we've had some on kind of like big picture stuff we've also done a lot of event specific stuff we talked about vault like three or four years ago and i feel as though it's a proper time as you would say to uh kind of update and kind of come back around to some of the things that i think i still get the most questions about which is bars man i feel like Mm. the struggle is very real on bars because it is not the other three events right it's not like a lower body leg event for women's gymnastics and so um yeah i'd like to again selfishly just like pick your brain and kind of make sure that we're extracting as much as we can from you but also you know the types of questions that i get are about uh, basics cast handstands fears on dismount so maybe just kind of skate around some of the most common things that we get in our inbox and uh no better person than to kind of have share some information that's someone like yourself who's been directly in the trenches you know what i mean thank you very much yep looking forward to it good can i just can we just come back to like your hobbies first of all because you sure. kind of like went, you Dude, I, I got some crazy new hobbies right now well you're gonna have to share aren't you because okay, your so community, I, you're basically your social circle are all listening to this. So let's <laughs> my friends, right? I'm just sure. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll spill the beans, man. So I, aside from being like a, a work kind of science person, is I've I grew up like watching sci-fi, fantasy, and like everything, right? So video games, TVs, movies, Lord of the Rings. Like me and my brother played all the video games, Starcraft, Warcraft. Like if you're a dork in that world, like I'm your best friend, right? So I play Magic the Gathering with my brother. So. Um, I've always like loved that medium and I actually really do have a big, uh, uh, hook into like music and art. Um, but I'm not good at drawing, right. I'm not good at painting. I'm not good at any of that kind of stuff. I'm decent at music just for my family growing up, but I've never, I've always had ideas of a story in my head of a sci-fi fantasy story. That'd be cool to make and what I would like it to look like, but it's just never come to reality. But thanks to the new, um, innovations in AI tech and AI prompting, um, there are now a lot of software that can, um, prompt art based on what you put in it. So I'm really good with words and descriptions and I've, I'm learning how to use AI art to get the thing in my head onto paper. And it's been incredibly fun. Like it's the only thing I've thought about in the last maybe like 10 years and starting shift where like I'm completely absorbed, like everything goes away and I just like lose three hours. So that's what I'm doing in my free time for fun is uh, that along with like actual friends and like, you know, dinners and like going out and doing things. But yeah, if I have like five hours, I'm trying to not do anything. Mm. It's that right now. And it's really cool. That is cool. It wasn't what I was expecting you to say. I was expecting you to be like, you know, I've gone from a, I don't know, a green belt to a black belt in the, <laughs> in the space of like eight weeks. And I'll be like, Dave, if anyone was going to do that, it would probably be you with your, uh, no, your no, focus. I, I need less physical activity for my hobbies, right? Like I already work out and like I'm plenty with that. Like the, the last thing I need is I tried to like join a running group for a while. I did like uh, somebody's like, you should go hiking or like you should join like a rock climbing gym. And I was like, dude, more exercise is not what I need. Like I, I have a, a very healthy, minimal amount of running and exercise that I think is good for me. Um, and if I like go more than that, it's just like not really good for me. So yeah, I'm good on the moderate health exercise right now after many years in gymnastics, you know, love it. Good times. Good times. How's fishing going now that we're, now that we're not going to talk about bars, how's fishing? Uh, I haven't been fishing for months. So, um, yeah, that, that's just going to have to wait until my diary kind of settles down a bit. January is a bit crazy. Um, obviously, winter's not as attractive a time to go for me. But uh, yeah, I ice think at the minute, say again. Ice fishing. Yeah, well, there is that. It's just not as appealing to me. <laughs> so, 
yeah uh, no. you know january's busy trying to set the year up with the events and the camps and my international diary and all of that kind of stuff so um yeah for now until the sun shines a bit more it's going to be parked yeah dogs are good Do <laughs> oh my god <laughs> it's the worst possible time to ask that question oh no they're away right Here, well no here's here's a story here's a story oh, so i i Anyone who's listening skip forward maybe <laughs> Six minutes and you'll get the thing you came here for. <laughs> no, no, no. This is this won't take too long. Um, so for the audience's benefit, I've got two Pomeranians. So li Very little cool. dogs. I, I went to the gym the other day, did a did a workout myself, um, and I've been out for like three hours. Now I came back to find there was uh quite a quantity of chocolate wrappers all oh. over the floor <laughs> of our house. Um I counted 13 wrappers of this one specific brand of chocolate. Um, now the concern sponsorship there is incoming. that sponsorship incoming. Well, no, 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 I won't, <laughs> I won't label the brand. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, chocolate's toxic for dogs, let alone a, a small dog of, of that size and the quantity that was eaten. And of course I didn't know if it was one, one of the dogs, yeah, which, 15 or 30, right? Yeah. Or whether it was both of them. So oh, no. yeah, an emergency trip to the vet. Um, right, and yeah, probably $1,500. I think it probably equates to later. Um, we discovered that it was the smallest one that had eaten 95, if not a hundred percent of all that <laughs> chocolate. Me. You discovered it was Leone. <laughs> <laughs> Leon, if you're listening, I love you. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. Oh dear! It, was, it wasn't the animals; it was Nick in his sleep. Exactly. There we go. Uh, anyway, the dogs are now fine, but for for a moment, it was touch and go because the vet did did confirm it was a toxic quantity for that dog to have, and so it was lucky we got it out of the system. So, how are the dogs? They're okay at the moment. Yeah, they're they're coming back. I've had better weeks, but yeah, they they they're okay. Let's well, get. Should we, we should talk about bars really before you lose half your audience. For sure, yeah. I, I am going to go not anywhere near bars if we keep going. So, anyways, um, <laughs> hard transition. That's what we're doing. Yeah. Uh, we talked three years ago. I think we talked about bars maybe before the pandemic and all the situation. <laughs> and uh, I think we had a good conversation around like the big picture stuff principles, which I definitely want to talk on again. But I think. I think a lot of the people out there, when they reach out, they want some more like meat on the bones. You know, they want some specific examples and or ideas. And then last year's symposium, when you talked a lot about floor, people really, I think, got a good picture into your world that they're not already like, you know, members of the academy and stuff. They saw like, oh, there's like this big picture philosophy piece. But yeah. there's also this layered like specific drills and specific things that you really like to see or look for to, to try to help people. So that's kind of my thought process is to start a little big picture and then kind of move our way down the funnel towards the end of getting like some really hardcore um, ideas, if that's okay with you. So um, yeah, anything before we dive in or? No, I just think, you know, what's what's important for the, for the listeners to understand about my approach, if they don't already know, it's just it's very simplistic. Mm. So, you know, it could almost be looked at as being like, is that it? Is that Nick's approach? But but yeah, that is it. And um, in, in good reason, I think our competitive advantage or one of them now as coaches is to try and simplify mm. because we're just getting overwhelmed with all the potential ideas that we could incorporate into a program and many of which are very, very good. Right. Um, but if you don't, you know, kind of skim that or filter those exercises so that you're left with just a narrow selection you're probably going to be doing too much and that that does tend to happen a lot when I'm going into gyms and coaches are um you know struggling to understand why a skill is not improving it's essentially because they're not giving any one drill or one skill time to improve they're trying to do so many things with it that you know I mean how much time can you spend on 10 drills in one bar session so right. yes you're getting a lot covered but you're not going into depth with any of them mm. and ultimately when it comes to bars repetition is one of going to be one of the most important aspects of of how much an athlete learns so um you know stripping away a program is as good as adding things in and i think that's an important mm. thing for the listeners to to understand and and also just be comfortable with potentially like a bit of a fear of missing out i guess like you know you might see an exercise you see a drill it looks fantastic but just just put it through your filter to start with and go well is that actually what my athlete needs right now like is that the missing part of the puzzle more often than not it, it's not mm, yeah very very well said there's and there's two things that you taught me probably like when we first started hanging out in 2015 that I think were large face palm moments for me, but also just like, I think is, is probably I'm a, I was a, a funnel of a larger problem. A lot of people in gymnastics have the first of which being is that 
I, I would have like seven or eight drills and then the main bars, right? And so 10 stations or things I wanted them to do in a 45 minute practice. And we knew basics were important. So by the time we get our grips on, we get up to the basics, we do all our shaping, we do that. And then we try to explain the drills. Then we finally get people going. We're like 30 minutes into the rotation, right? It's like mm. really hard to get a real assignment going. And I remember you um, asking me one time about like, well, how many things are like, you just said like, send me a picture of what it looks like, whatever. And you were like, probably half of that you don't need. You know, and it wasn't that you don't need it technically. It was like, it's not going to be effective in any way, shape or form for a 45 minute practice. And I know for sure, a lot of these people who are listening have 30 minutes. They don't have an hour, hour and a half to do bars and mosey around and look at film and set this drill up. Like it's really a group of 10 girls that are moving. And so that's the first thing I'd love to hear more on is, is kind of like maybe that minimal effective dose or finding efficiency, you know? The question I often ask coaches is if you took that exercise away, how would it impact your, your program? Mm. And so sometimes, again, this is all very well intentioned stuff and, and there's always context behind this. So, you know, we've got to put it through our own filters. But essentially, if a, if a coach was doing, um, I was going to use an acrobatic example, but as this is a bars episode, we should use a bars one. If they were doing, you know, 10 exercises for a kip caster handstand, mm. um, let's think about this more from a, a technical perspective. So 10 technical drills, you know, the body doesn't know the difference between those different drills it's just feeling the actions so for example the hips are extending or the shoulders are closing so you know the body doesn't understand the difference so if you're doing 20 of one exercise versus two sets of 10 of another exercise the body's getting the same kind of response from it mm. um and so when it's when it, i mean i see this more in, on floor when you've got like 12 different round off drills within a floor basic circuit and you're like yeah. look just get rid of nine of them and you'll still have the same outcome so what's what's the point of doing 12 you you can just do three why are you laughing dave what's funny because you just led to my next point in my head and i was right. like you know you roasted me for something that i did i'm going to talk about next okay <laughs> no, you told me this and it's my fault <laughs> I, was gonna, I was thinking should we go back to the dogs and fishing because you're laughing no. at me already so <laughs> we've uh, had no we've had no british mishaps no words that i think are hilarious i didn't yet, think so. so okay use of language has been more than appropriate in intercontinental basil have you been cooking with basil lately or no not lately look right back to bars dave come on <laughs> Okay, we're on it. So anyway, as I, as I was saying, you know, sometimes you can just get, you know, the question is, if you got rid of that exercise, would it make a difference to the program? And this is also for skills that have already been learned. Now, I'm a massive advocate for a handstand, of course. You know, no one's going to speak more highly of the importance of, of having perfect handstands than myself. But once your athlete has achieved that perfect handstand, you don't need to invest an hour and a half of body shaping a week into the handstand because they've already got it. You need to maintain it, but you can start playing with how much time uh, you need to actually maintain that skill. So the next question is, if you reduce the amount of time spent on that, would you still get the same benefit or would that skill deteriorate? And I just, just use a handstand as an example, but you know, training is just all about being as efficient and effective with the time that you've got available. That's what this this is, because if it didn't matter that the athletes were training 60 hours a week, then of mm. course we could do all these things because variety is important. It's probably a bit more enjoyable and we can play around. But ultimately, as you've mentioned, the, you know, time is a big constraint for most of the audience that are listening. Mm. Um, and even the most highest performing athletes and coaches that are listening um, and they're out there, time is still a constraint for them as well because they're trying to teach more uh, you know a wider broader range of skills yeah. because their repertoire and you know the doors are open the avenues are open so i guess what i'm trying to summarize here is you know always just put your program through the filter of like mm. is this what my athlete needs if i got rid of that would it would, would the athlete deteriorate in their performance just so that you're understanding what the benefit is of of actually doing something um, yeah. and, and it's always important to remember that one fantastically performed exercise is far better than five or six dreadful ones. So it mm. doesn't matter how good the activity is, which Instagram account you've pulled it from. And however, uh, you know, amazing that coach is, there's some great content out there with some great coaches. It's not about that. But if you do it poorly, it, you, it's not going to be beneficial. So you're much better off just choosing one drill and doing that to the best of the athlete's ability and sometimes stripping away additional drills is the best way to do that because it allows you to focus your attention focus your time get the repetition in so it's not a fancy way of coaching that might be a british term saying it's quite fancy um you know it doesn't look overly complex it's actually the opposite we're trying to refine and 
I'm going off on a tangent, and I know I talked about this a lot on your on your podcast, but I do think it's relevant. But you've got to think about where you get your inspiration from and, and your own philosophies. Like, I love Italian cooking. I like going to an Italian restaurant when you know that the only ingredients they're going to be cooking with, and here it comes, is basil <laughs> instead of basil okay but you've got uh you know tomatoes you've got fresh pasta uh, a bit of garlic salt pepper there's not much else that goes into their food like a couple of different things but there's not much that goes in but what they're able to do with those ingredients is to create a masterpiece because mm. those ingredients are of the most exceptional standard you know they're completely fresh they're handmade um from trusted suppliers and the message here, I guess the analogy is that you can create a masterpiece with your gymnast just using a finite number of ingredients mm. as long as they are of an exceptional quality. So that's my philosophy when it comes to bars. Yeah. And I just, yeah, really encourage the listeners to do the same thing. Addition yeah. by subtraction, you know, take stuff away in order to improve. Yeah. And I think we can continue down this, uh, this path of, uh, things Dave did wrong and Nick corrected or taught me on. And the reason I was laughing before is because that this conversation of efficiency and really knowing what you're trying to find as the actual, you know, uh, skill in front of you, what it's going to look like is, I think I sent you a, a video of a girl doing like a Uchenko lay or something like that. And I was like, Hey, what do you think on this, uh, with like her entry? And you were like, well, like, what are you looking for? And in that moment I realized, I don't really know what that like, you know, I don't really know what the gold standard shape is that I'm trying to even see on the board is and what you call a Kodak moment or a snapshot. And uh, it kind of like pulled the rug out from underneath me because I was like, Oh, I don't actually know where I would like her hands to be. And it's not in this is a bigger picture, which is not saying there's one technique that everyone has to do. But in the moment as a coach, you need to know what technique you're looking for, you know, you look where are the hands supposed to be are the ears supposed to be covered where are the hips supposed to be. And that was a big eye opening moment for me, because I actually really didn't know the key points of performance of a Yurchenko. And you were like, Okay, well, you need to figure you know, you need to learn that first, because thinking about efficiency, one of the, the most of uh, easy ways to burn time is to not really have a very clear set of Kodak pictures to compare to, and then not have one or two drills in your back pocket that like if the arms go here, how can I help the arms get to here? Well, there's a good drill for that, right? So outside of the gym coaches, and hopefully the benefit of your content and mine and others is that you can spend more time outside the gym, cutting through the noise and finding what you really like and what works, and then having two or three things to do to perfection than being like, here's 49 drills that could possibly fix an arm circle. You know what I mean? And so I think that's maybe the second thing I really valued you for when you taught me that was like, do you really understand the key points of performance? And if not, it's okay, you need to find someone who can teach you that and make sure that you understand what you're aiming for, you know? Yeah, I think one of my favorite quotes on this topic is that clarity precedes mastery. So you can't achieve mastery unless you've got crystal clear clarity. You certainly can't communicate it to an athlete mm. um, because obviously they're just going to be responding to your feedback and your exercises that you're giving them. So if you're a little bit vague about exactly what you're after, then the athlete will interpret that as well. Um, and yeah, without clarity, muddy water, it's just very, very difficult to to achieve a, a high performance standard. And I think that's it. You know, you know that I talk a lot about the balance between standards and expectations. Mm. and your expectations i believe should be on a sliding scale you know there are times where you should have super high expectations of what the athlete is doing um there are times when we have to lower our expectations um it could be that the athlete's tired it could be that it's a new skill so our expectations mm. can't be high they, they might be coming back from injury or holidays you know just as some examples as mm. we approach competition our expectations are more likely to be higher um mm. If they're performing a skill that they've consolidated, our expectations are most likely to be high. So that's on a sliding scale. But our standards, to me, uh, are something that we don't ever lower. Our standards represent our understanding of a skill. So new emerging coaches won't have high standards because they've yet to be exposed or have the knowledge of what a high standard is. So let's take a backward giant, for example, um, a, a emerging lower level coach that's maybe entering the sport, doesn't have much experience, you know, won't recognize that the arms need to be completely straight and the ears need to be covered as the athlete shifts and the shift needs to happen at a certain point and we want them to hang underneath the bar as low as possible, all of that kind of stuff. They'll see the athlete circling around the bar and that might be okay for them because, hey, they're doing a backward giant, right? So. Our standards are something that we should always um, strive to improve. And that for me just comes through knowledge, mm. gaining new knowledge, gaining new experience. Now, I'm not bashing anyone here that 
hasn't got the experience because we've all been there uh, and I'm still there on many different skills as well of having, um, you know, not having complete clarity of, of what I'm, what I'm trying to do. So like you said, mentorship, research, spending times in, in, in high performing environments, you know, going to gyms where exceptional bar work is just part of what they do, then that's how you're going to raise your own standard. Mm. And then it's down to you to be able to communicate that in a effective way to your athletes to try and raise their performance and that's 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 the key now what we often get wrong in coaching is that we have um what can go wrong in coaching is that we have these super high standards but that's great there's nothing wrong with that but we also have massively high expectations too much of the time so over a prolonged period without being flexible and sometimes this can result in athletes that have you know an issue with failure now, having really high expectations doesn't necessarily suggest that, the, that there's bad coaching going on. Um, but if, you don't, if we don't allow our athletes to fail and make mistakes, of course, and the repercussions of that could potentially be that, yeah, they just struggle to fail and make mistakes and they have a very negative view on, on, you know, on, on failure, basically, as opposed to it just being part of the process. Mm, so, yeah, so. standards and expectations, super high super important yeah. i should say and I, th- I think those are great right i think like if you if you get a bunch of great drills but you don't understand those two principles first it doesn't matter if you literally went to like the world bar champion and watched all her drills and did it all and tried to take that to your gym it just wouldn't stick right because those two things by themselves are critical as like a foundational piece and i think so now as we move maybe that's kind of like the most macro coaching philosophy right around this topic as we move one layer deeper um before we go fishing <laughs> girls. I wrote that in the outline for the notes, by the way, it's for me to you wink there. So I paused to wink. Yeah. Um, but before we going down, I know you have like more specific subset principles that for bars or skills in particular that are, you know, whether it's vision or things like that you believe in, could you just, cause we talked about these in other episodes, but can you just quickly maybe highlight those real quick? That way people can set the stage for the next piece when we talk about skills. Yeah. Okay. So I've got five principles that I teach bars by. There's there's four on that acrobatics, but there's five when it comes to bars. So um, what I think is important with teaching or having an, a principle led approach is that it again creates some intention and purpose around what I'm doing with the athletes. You know what I'm what I'm looking for. Um, it gives me clarity on on where my attention should be focused, and it helps us, I think, as coaches to really understand what these key well philosophies and principles are that are contributing to good bars Mm. so these are my principles the listeners might have their own that they coach by or potentially just different use of language around some of the same points but i'll just um i'll just cover them off quickly so we've got sight flight swing shape and extension and uh the beauty of these is they're they're all very well connected so I'll, i'll break these down one by one starting with sight this is one of the acrobatic principles as well because as i've um said many times on many podcasts and webinars i believe there's a a deliberate place to look in every single skill that's being performed most of the time the athlete is looking at the body or the apparatus Mm. so an example on bars would be that we want the athlete to look at the low bar as they're doing the descent of their backward giant so assuming they're of course doing their back giant down towards the low bar um we want them to be able to see the low bar and that's going to help build confidence uh, awareness of where their body is and in, in terms of the environment and of course how close the low bar is to them but it's also going to improve um, body shape and the aesthetics the technical qualities that the judges are looking for when performing a skill as well so those are kind of the, the main benefits of of vision being visual yep. in, in gymnastics um, the next one, I'll go in, in not really any particular order here. Let's move to uh, shape. We know that shape underpins absolutely everything that we do in gymnastics, whether it's bars or not. That's also one of the acrobatic principles. So I've covered sight and shape so far, which are shared between bars and acrobatics. Um, if we don't get those static shapes right, then we can't expect our athletes to be able to move with beautiful shapes as well. So if we were looking at the, you know, the absolute bottom of the physical preparation pyramid, we're going to have some static positions there, hollow, arch, straight, you know, tuck positions, etc. Moving on from shape, we have then got extension. Now, I said that these principles are linked because, of course, more, more often than not, we don't have exceptional shape unless we've got very good extension with the athlete as well. So extension can happen in support and in hang. And you've done a podcast recently, and um, uh, forgive me for... Um, not remember Brett. the guest's name yeah but that, that was that was right and he talked about uh, above the bar work and below the bar work right 
Yep. And that's what I mean by being enhanced support and being underneath the bar. So if we think about extension from a support perspective, most applicable like a handstand, we want the athlete to be pushing up their toes towards the ceiling as much as possible. So basically the growing tool in a handstand, trying to get their toes to touch the ceiling. And we're going to see their upper body uh, completely extended. So elevated shoulders. We might use language like cover your ears, uh, push away the gaps, grow tall, you know, different cues like that. Now, underneath the bar, it's exactly the same concept, but of course it's reversed because we're not pushing now, we're trying to hang instead. So we still want the toes to, or the hips to try and pull down towards the floor. We want maximum extension so the athlete is hanging through their shoulder girdle instead of extending. And that's just going to result in, again, nice aesthetics. It's going to look good. Mm. It's also going to just improve the general mechanics of swing swing being the next principle and i said these are all linked okay so i've covered sight i've covered uh shape extension and now swing and of course swing's just massively important for so many skills you know you won't see a great bar worker unable to swing effectively that means swinging with energy swinging swinging with amplitude and so Again, as a philosophy, swinging will become a big part of any bars program that I am uh, working on with, with an athlete. I want all athletes on bars to be able to do a swing flyaway and a swing front away. I want them all to be able to do uh, a, a candlestick release or a shoulder stand release. I want them to be able to do that for a backwards skill like a ginger or a flyaway. But I want them to be able to do that in a reverse position, potentially for a Jaeger or a double front dismount. Um, I don't know what the terminology you would use for that, but it's kind of like a handstand release. You know, yeah. so they let, let go of the bar in a handstand uh, and you tend to hold them by the wrists or, or near the elbows. And I just want to jump in before you go to the next <clears> one too, because a big question people get is like, I understand how hard, like you want to develop a really powerful bar swinger and stuff like that, but like the fear of peeling is very high for a lot of young athletes. Who maybe their hands are smaller, they don't have grip strength yet or something like that. So are there any things on your mind that you're, when you're a younger athletes, you're like, no, I want you to tap hard, but if you get the, if they peel one time or they like, you know, come under the bar one time, sometimes that puts a big fear block on them. Mm, yeah, that's a really, really valid point. Um, so for me, it's not necessarily about tapping harder. It's about being smooth with the action. Mm. So a lot of kids, when they peel off, um, not all yeah. the time, of course, but it's because the action has, has been a bit jerky. Mm. So they've made a uh, too swift a shape change or transition is too aggressive. And again, that mm. kind of ruins swing. You know, a good swing will look very fluid. It will be soft, actually. You know, it would look very transitional mm. um, as opposed to looking too aggressive and dynamic. Now, we can save that level of uh, of energy and aggressive taps for things like uh, to catch Fs, which will happen later on. But when we're first teaching the kids just to swing, right. we need it to be smooth. So that's one, one thing that we need to look for. Um, the better the extension is, so the more they're hanging underneath the bar, the more likely the swing is going to be smooth. Because if you mm. imagine all the angles are already open yeah now if you've got an athlete that's got angles in their shoulders so they're actually pulling up on the bar which creates um, an arch in the lower back and a shoulder angle then when they're trying to swing those angles are, are opening and closing and it becomes very reactive and that's just going to kill swing and, and they're much more likely to to mm. peel off like you said before so and I feel that's like timing is part of it too, right? Like you're kind of hitting on this too. If they don't really understand where and when to tap, sometimes they put all the smooth energy in the wrong spot directly at the bottom of the bar. I think of a lot of girls who are trying to learn some like swing to fly with the first time and they they miss the bar with a very large kind of pike angle instead of that long stretch. So mm -hmm. now they're, they're piking and hitting directly at the bottom yep. as if they're doing a Kovacs tap, right? Instead of pushing back long and getting through the bottom all the way through. So um, correct me if I'm wrong there, but I feel like that timing is a huge one too. I think it's massive. Yeah. And, and I, I think about it from a, a clock face perspective and mm, right. normally the, the tap or well, uh, gotta be, diff gotta be uh, careful here. Coaches interpret tap very differently. Yep. Some will think of it as the timing of the arch. Some of, yeah. some people will think of it as a timing of the, of the kick. Changes. So I tend to use the language hang and kick. So that means arch and kick, you know, arch to hollow, for example. So um, at 20 past roughly at 20 past the hour, uh, that's where I'm going to see the hang, the hang mm. phase, which is being initiated from both the shoulders and the hips. Mm. And at about 22, I'm seeing that transition now back towards the hollow position, roughly. It's roughly there. So, yeah. um, and I think, you know what, this is one of the key, key components of bars, Dave, because as with all basic fundamental skills, they're actually very time intensive. And right. if you want them to be 
a, a super high standard, you're going to have to invest a lot of time in them, despite the fact that we consider them to be basic skills. Right. Like a handstand is, is a basic skill. A round off is considered a basic skill. But just think about how much time we've got to invest in it to get it right uh, and to not get it wrong. Mm. All right. So um, to to build up a swing, there isn't really a time where you would ever stop doing that. You know, I'd be working on swinging with amplitude with 13, 14, 15 year old junior international athletes because it's still important. You know, I teach a double back from a swing, not from a cast or a handstand mm. or a giant. They they yeah. learn them from a swing. The Jaeger is taught, first of all, from a swing because swing is so important. And so ultimately, um, if if coaches can get that right, it just makes bars so much easier. Yeah. Yeah. And I kind of cut you off, but I think we have a couple more principles here to get through. So I want to make sure you get those. Yeah. I'll, I'll just touch on one more thing, one more little hack, which I think is useful for swinging because it's a fair objection or challenge with the fact that little kids will not swing well that mm. is just the reality you might have taught them beautiful shapes but they've got small hands they might not quite figure out the timing so you're laughing at me again david I'm sorry I'm, you're so I was, fishing, I was gonna make a fishing joke i didn't want to do it <laughs> oh, God. i see a lot of like kids that are kind of like yeah he, he just like freaking all over the place you know looks like upstream salmon yeah, there's a lot going on, but they're not really creating much, much in terms of movement. We always used to say working hard, but going nowhere. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's it. Um, and so a trapeze is just a really good tool to use in, yeah. in that instance. So if you just hang a trapeze from, from a bar rail, the actual bar would have to be quite high, depending on the length of the straps. What the trapeze does is gives the athlete time. They've, they're now on like they're swinging on a pendulum. Mm. And it just is the ultimate way of teaching the principle of swing to young kids because they will suddenly have so much time to show their actions and it actually creates a fair amount of enjoyment on bars as well so there's a little hack that people might have seen at my master classes or on my social just use a trapeze really really good thing to do with your younger kids while you're waiting for them to grow and to develop mm -hmm. the understanding of the of the movements as well okay right so you want me to move on to the next principle so i think the last one that, that is going to be yeah flight uh, flight essentially is that bars you need to fly so whether that is a fly away or a front away uh, teaching a pack a takachev these are all flighted skills and they need amplitude mm. and again we've got to remember that all these principles are connected right so we're not going to achieve flight without swing we're not going to achieve swing without um, shape and extension and so it's just crucial that we've got the mix of all of them combined together you know great bars is going to come from the accumulation of mm. these things being taught correctly now the beauty of something like extension is that we teach it everywhere it doesn't matter if it's a kip cast a handstand a handstand uh on the floor a round off a front handspring back handspring you know extension is seen in everything that we should be doing in gymnastics so as a principle, it's pretty easy to get the athlete to understand that concept because you're constantly reminding them of what that is. Mm. It's pushing up tall, it's covering the ears, it's opening the shoulder angle, getting rid of the gaps. You know, that's what that's what extension is. If you're echoing that across all four events or six events, then it's it's going to go in. Like the kid's going to understand that. Mm. Um, and hopefully we can start to see, you know, the benefits of that understanding when it comes to the technical skills. Mm. But now the opposite to that is we've got to remember if a coach is not delivering content on extension or they're not teaching that principle it will have the same impact but in a negative way mm. it will affect every skill and it will expose every skill as being an issue because the coach is missing out just that one principle mm. um the same with shape if we haven't taught very good shapes it will expose every skill on every uh, apparatus and at every event and so the fastest way to improve bars is usually to make sure that yeah. the athlete first of all has great shape and of course, that they're strong enough to maintain that shape through movement. And then the second of all, that they're able to extend. And I often say to coaches, like, just set yourself a challenge this week of covering the ears. Mm. I want you to cover your ears on your hurdles on the floor, in your round offs, in your back handsprings, your front handsprings. Just really focus on covering your ears. When you go to bars, every handstand, cover the ears. In the extension phase of the glide, of the kip, cover the ears. Every single backward giant, don't allow the athlete to expose their ears at all. And if you just have it as a theme, the athlete will absorb that, you know, because you're going to constantly be reminding them of it and hopefully finding, um, you know, preparation exercises, interventions mm. to help them with that concept. Right. But, but it will be absorbed. Mm. 
the opposite approach to this, Dave, is to focus on so many things at once that you're just constantly moving the goalposts. So one mm. minute I'm talking about the timing of the tap, the next minute I'm talking about the chest being out, the next is the head position. Like four corrections at once come on. So next turn, I want you to keep your head and get your arms up, tap a little bit harder to make sure you get your toes here. You're like, I that's know. right. That's right. That's really common in coaching. And, and we do that with the best intentions because we coach what we have just basically witnessed as opposed to kind of zooming out a bit and actually thinking, well, how do I not overwhelm the athlete with information here? Um, how can I try and achieve something significant over the course of this 30, 40 minutes, as opposed to just making a couple of corrections on a few different mm -hmm. turns, but then moving the goalpost to something else instead. Mm -hmm. So you've, you've, you've heard me talk about themes before, I think, Dave, and I just think they're really powerful. So, you know, having your athletes get their grips on and, you know, have a little uh, pep talk at the beginning and essentially just outline what the expectations are of that session to create some intention behind it. You know, today, yeah. girls, we are focusing on covering your ears. I'd like to see that in your backward giants. I'd like to see it in your, all your handstands. And why don't we just start with a couple of exercises on the floor to help us all understand exactly what I'm after. So yeah, line your back with your arms covering your ears. Great. Now let's all do a handstand. Now let's do a back extension roll to handstand and make sure your ears are covered. Oh, look, I've got a video here of a gold standard example. Can you see the ears mm -hmm. are covered throughout the whole skill? Bam. Right. Now that is how I'm going to judge whether this uh, training session on bars has been a success or not, because we've created intention behind it then. Mm. The athlete knows exactly what you want. And then all your feedback will be related to that theme. That's that's how you make big strides in a single training yeah. session. Yeah. And I love this too, because I think what we can do here is we can kind of use your analogy of like, you know, really high quality cooking ingredients to paint a picture how now I think a lot of people, you know, we'll cover three things I know people struggle with the most. And I think what we're going to do is paint the picture of going down into these kind of skills and then coming back out and pointing to these principles that you said were really, really important. And so in our analogy here, it's like, so yeah, maybe your, your phenomenal ingredients for a pizza are like these things you talked about. And like the problem that I see is that people get a, a not so ideal pizza and they just make more pizzas, right? They're just like, do more kips, do more giants, do more handstands, do more dismounts. And they're not taking us a, a moment to, like you said, step back and reflect on like, is there a fundamental problem in a common denominator with shaping or sight or something like that? And so I think this would be a really cool way to kind of like dip in and out of each of these like pockets of, of problem skills for people. And I, you know, maybe we can present a couple of the most common things you see as the output that are going wrong, but then we can kind of take a step back and like, well, these are some things to think about. And these are drills that reflect those principles. Right. And so that we, we covered uh, tap swings in depth. And I think the best place to go to is, is probably just kipping, just basic kipping or uh, mm. I forget the British term of, 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 we tend to call it an upstart. Upstart. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so kipping, and then with that comes just kipping casting, right? And I don't want to say kip cast handstands, but like it could be kip cast to horizontal for a compulsory or 45 or handstand, but these principles are all the same. And so mm. the most common thing we see is someone who really struggles to have good compression and get a cast to connect right at all. And so let's maybe talk about how some of these principles might be relevant here. And then maybe we can share some drills, you know? Yeah. And so I guess for the benefit of the audience, we're talking about compression. We're looking at like a fold, aren't we? After the kip. Yeah. Uh, and the way that we should think about that is kind of like pressing a spring down. We've mm. got, then got some stored energy. We let go of that spring and it opens up and exerts the energy. And we, we want to think about the, the cast handstand happening in the same way. Um, and so I think, and I'm, look, I'm no expert in kips. I've had a lot of help myself uh, with content because I've, I've, you know, working with the age of gymnast that is learning a kip has not particularly been my forte. So, you know, shout out to a bunch of coaches, um, you know, Amber, Jay, Leone have all helped me a lot with, with um, some really creative kip exercises, but again, they all just follow the same principles. So I'm still looking for extension. I've got to have a really good understanding of what shape I'm looking for within the swing. Um, I want to make sure that the height of the, the kip is, is correct. Um, and for, for, after some lengthy debate on this, it seems like a, a kind of a halfway point between the, the floor and where the bar is, is, is about right for most athletes because it lifts the center of mass up already. Um, whereas I used to favor a really low glide and extension, yeah. but actually the center of mass is so low, it makes it quite challenging for the athletes to, to pick their body up. So there's some, you know, biomechanical principles we can think about. Um, if I'm, if I'm thinking about teaching a kip, I've, I've, there's two things that are probably most important to me. One is repetition. And two is that all the drills do need to finish in that compressed position, that, that pike fold, because we've always got to think about the next move. And of course, you know, a kip is only useful if we're going to use it for a, a caster handstand afterwards as well. So making sure that the, the exit of the skill or the drill is in a, in a compressed position is important. It doesn't matter mm. if you're doing a drop kip. 
or sets of drop kips. Um, if you're doing front hip circles, which are good to get the athlete to take their shoulders forwards, whether they're doing a, uh, you know, kind of a drill where they're standing with their feet on a block and they're just kind of squatting down and extending their legs again in order to get the upper body position right. You know, these are all all um, exercises where we want to put them back into a pike fold, essentially, right. where they fold over the bar. Now, some athletes will get that pike fold wrong because of where the bar's sitting, because yeah. we, we need to make sure the bar's sitting on their hips, not on their thighs. Mm. Because if it's sitting on their thighs and they can't obviously fold around the bar. So for some athletes, they need to depress their shoulders a fair amount in order to get the bar sitting at the right place. Mm. Some athletes will need to elevate their shoulders or press down on the bar a little bit. But that's something the coaches should look for. Yeah. And um, when it comes to the visual aspect, I want the athlete to be looking at their toes when they finish in that compressed position as well. So they've done their glide uh, or, or the actual kip itself. They're now folded over the bar. They should clearly see their feet in front of the bar as well so that's that's when we know that we've got the vision box ticked as well as that compressed position mm -hmm. but ultimately repetition is going to be the most important aspect of of kips i believe a good kips yeah. because i kind of think this is a bit like a souk on vault most kids are going to be able to do them yeah yeah because i mean like you, you can do a souk on vault and and if you've got a powerful kid, most powerful kids can chuck a full in on the floor and it won't look pretty. But a lot of kids can do one, even if it's just on a rod floor or, or a yeah. long tramp, because they don't have to be incredibly technical to actually successfully uh, uh, perform the skill. And it's the same with the kip. A lot of kids are going to be able to do them. But of course, it's about the quality of the repetitions that you're doing. Right. We want to mm. make sure that uh, we are being patient enough and making sure those principles are, um, you know, are, are in place. So quality repetition and just being okay with the mundanity of what that might look like so if, if mm. you know in a 30 minute bar session you might need to do 20 minutes worth of kipping because if you've got a group of eight gymnasts um them going around a circuit once or twice seems like a lot from a coach's perspective but actually each kid has not really done that many repetitions when they've done that yeah you know if we just break that down and say that you've done so you've got eight stations they do 10 repetitions okay cool so they've done 80 reps well, they're going to learn a kip in 80 reps when that's repeated maybe four times a week. Of course they are. But they're going to learn it a lot quicker if they do 160 reps, 320 mm. reps, you know, 400 reps. They're just, it's just going to accelerate the process. So um, getting a decent amount of numbers in is, is going to be key. And that's pretty exhausting if you're spotting yeah. some of those stations, if you've yeah. got groups of eight kids. But that might be what's necessary to improve. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think something that's really important to highlight here is something I think you and I agree on philosophy wise too, is, is to really understand how to reverse engineer a big picture into smaller components and look at each of those things kind of on a spreadsheet or like a spokes on a wheel and look at what those things are. And so if you see someone who's really struggling with a kip, you can go through your checkbox of what you kind of have, which is like, are you looking at your toes? Do you see your toes? Because if their head is out when they try to kip, it's going to be very hard to compress their upper chest and get over the bar. So you kind of go through that first. Like, do you know where to look? Do you understand, you know, where your ear should be covered? Do you understand how you're supposed to put the bar in your hips? Like you kind of go through those principle based ones first. But I think you and I both really um, kind of came to terms with this when we started working together at your masterclass the first time was sometimes the limiting factors are not those bigger pictures, but there are things behind that at a deeper level of a physical preparation or a flexibility point of view, what we call the basics of the basics. So if you have an athlete who can't touch their toes because their hamstrings are extremely stiff, it's going to be hard to ask them to get into a good compression pike fold, right? Vice versa. If you have an athlete who's young and their lower core is just not able to even hold their knees up in a tuck hold, how in the world do you think they're going to hold their feet up on a really good extended glide and be able to really rapidly slap into the bar? It's not going to happen, right? And it's not that it can't happen. It's just that you have to understand as a coach, well, it could be a visual thing. It could be a lean thing. It could be a fear thing, but also it could be a basic hamstring flexibility thing. It could be a basic shoulder strength thing. It could be a basic core thing. And if that athlete can't even do a tuck hold hanging or can't do a single press walk, right? I think that's going to be a really important issue to deal with. And a lot of times coaches, unfortunately, don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear that the issue is strength and you have to get stronger because they want to do drills and get the kip and it's fun. But if you skip steps and sacrifice, not all that flexibility or not all that core strength, what do you think happens when you try to go from a kip to a kip cast 45 to a kip cast handstand pirouette in two years, right? Like it's going to be extremely challenging. So taking a step back and working, like checking, like, am I doing core strength every day and compression work every day? Am I doing shoulder strength at least twice to three times a week, right? Like, I think that is just so pivotal because sometimes, again, people find the end result of a pizza is not what they want, but they don't go all the way back to be like that. The basil that I got is not high quality, masterful ingredients that I'm putting into this pizza. Yeah, I think that, you know, you're absolutely right. The, the low hanging fruit will always be physical preparation. 
Mm. You know, if we don't tick that box first, that that what well, you know, pyramid of preparation. If we don't get that layer right, it doesn't matter what drills you're trying to do. The athlete just yeah. won't be able to achieve them. Um, and yeah, that might not be everyone's favourite thing to hear. Uh, but the beauty of this is, particularly with the youngest children, it's like they just get a lot stronger, much, much, well, very, very fast, essentially. Yeah. You know, they are really high responders to physical preparation. Mm. So if, you know, you can see a difference within weeks. I mean, mm. like a couple of weeks, if you if you start implementing some new drills um, and and it's it's easier than having to deal with, you know, a 15 year old that's training 30, 30 hours a week. And we've got to really think about recovery here and training load from a macro perspective and how many routines and hard landing It's like, no. OK, you've got a group of eight year old kids. <laughs> They're going to recover really quickly. They're going to come in with an abundance of energy and, uh, you know, you can wear them out. And that's what they need to build up yeah. that capacity to train, you know, yeah. some some conditioning there. And they'll get strong really, really quick if you're just consistent, which is obviously mm -hmm. you're aware of my daily dozen model. It's just yeah. based on simplicity and repetition that you do yeah. a certain number of categories of exercises every single training day. It's the most simple form of conditioning that you can think of. You know, mm -hmm. every training day you do cast a handstands, every training day you do a rope climb and upper body stuff. So, uh, and they respond really, really fast to that. So that should be the good news for coaches that are listening. Mm -hmm. You know, if they're, if they're struggling with some of those, as you said, basics of the basics, like you know, if your kid's not able to hold their feet up in a glide, yeah, they're not going to be able to do a kip, but they might be able to do it in, in a few weeks, hold their feet up in the glide. If you just do a little bit more core every single day. Right. Right. And I think that's a, a really good kind of like, you know, maybe compulsory or kind of entry level skill. And I'd like to maybe move the conversation to one that again is, is plaguing many athletes, which is like getting consistent, really good giants. Mm -hmm. And I think in this situation, it is the most guilty of the end result. People are coaching the end result, which is just kick your toes harder, like just get your feet over the bar, right? They're looking at the end of missing a giant or having a, an uncontrolled giant that's a little bit wonky. And they're coaching the end result versus pulling it back and actually thinking about like, well, it's actually the timing of the tap or it's the lack of extension, right? Or it's the, it's the lack of vision being put into a really specific spot that's keeping the head in. And so I'd like to maybe talk about what some of the common issues are you find are making giants not be as effective. And then we can talk about maybe a couple of drills and then finally move on to dismounts and kind of, uh, you know, pull this all together here. Okay. So I think one of the, one of the big issues here is, is just a lack of physical development. Mm what we have got to try and do as coaches is to one coach the athlete that's standing in front of us but also like a chess game you're trying to anticipate the next moves as well right and bars is as one of the the events where you're going to suffer earliest as a result of a changing body mm. puberty getting taller um you know managing those changes limb length different you know all of a sudden i'm now closer to the low bar my, you know, if, it, if an athlete grows 10 centimeters or a few inches, then, you know, the difference of, of their core strength could be significant. Yeah. And bars is where you're going to see it first and yeah. bars is where you're going to get impacted. And this is probably where I would imagine the listeners can really resonate with this, that they'll be like, well, my no bars, used quick. To, yeah, my, my <laughs> gymnast used to be able to do this. It's like, yeah, they used to be able to do it before they hit puberty, before they grew. Mm. Now their lack of physical development is being exposed by the fact that their body has changed. So mm. like a chess game, it's like a chess game, but it's a predictable one. It's like it's like playing chess, but you know the moves because you know that that athlete is going to grow. You know they're going to get taller. So if you haven't done all the front end work, which is to make them super strong, you know not only conditioning but real strength, um, core development, you know upper body development, shape understanding. If you haven't done that pre puberty, then there's a really good chance that your athlete will suffer when they start to grow. Mm. Um, so we're just making it harder for ourselves. And, and the reason why we make this mistake is because the athlete in front of us at this stage at eight, nine years old is able to do the skill. Mm. So some of us, we won't even register that they're going to have a problem in two years time. It's like, Hey, I've got a nine year old and she can do a backward giant. <laughs> cool. Yeah, that's good. Okay. But are you anticipating maybe some of those technical errors or their lack of physical shape, which uh, physical strength, which maybe isn't being exposed now, but are you anticipating how that could be a problem in the future? Mm. It's difficult, particularly for sort of emerging coaches to understand because there's no crystal ball. You right. know, all they're doing is seeing that their kid can can do a back giant. So they think that everything's going to be fine and they'll yeah. just be able to progress on to the next stage, you know, that next move on the chessboard, which is, uh, you know, to do a giant with a turn, for example. Mm. Um, so I think that's that's one aspect is just not investing enough time in really good physical preparation. Yep. And the next one would be just to get them to do a backward giant too soon. And we see this on straps or metal bar, loop bar, whatever the audience refer it to, because you can strap a kid into that, cast them up to handstand with some help and just kind of spin them around the bar. 
And and again, because they're young, yeah, because they're young and they're snappy and they've got energy, they'll probably do it. They'll get around the bar. You know, some of them they won't, some of them they will, and then they'll figure out how to do it more often successfully. They'll start to develop an understanding of the tap. Um, but they're scratching the surface really about, you know, from a coaching and a methodology perspective of swing, shape, extension. Mm. And again, because the athlete is flying around that bar, we then go, well, they can do it there. So let's move them on to the next step. But that's the issue. We've got gaps. And if we skip over those gaps and move them on or move them up the skill ladder, it's just going to get exposed later on. I think this is the difference between higher performing coaches. They understand where gaps are before they've actually seen them. You know, you're anticipating the fact that that, issue on the backward giant which i can't really see now but i haven't covered it so it's going to be a problem in the future you know they're they're able to anticipate what's next mm. um so that'll be my my next thing so here not enough physical preparation and then just going too soon with spinning them around a bar yeah and, yeah and i have a good comment on this and i think we can then ask a quick question but which is mm. i think there's been there's no better and more relevant um, example of when your principles show up as the most important, which is the, the falling part of a giant, which terrifies so many athletes, right? They don't know, understand, you know, shape and extension and vision. And so they fall in a slightly compressed, not really open shape and then hop, 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 and they get scared of peeling in the bottom. Right. So like yeah. that was very, uh, revolutionary for me when you taught me that, which is like, are they really completely extended ears, completely covered, staring at the bar and they know exactly where their toes are going because their head is in, but they're looking at the low bar and they know where they're coming. Right. And when we started to implement just way more simple drills to get them to confidently fall on their own, not Dave hauling them to a cast handstand, death gripping their wrist. And it's going to be okay if I don't make it, but really just letting them play around with kip cast and just from 45, just really long extension, see the low bar and just tap and then shoulder stand into a mat or into a pit and just getting them confident on like how hard and how much tension they have to create on the fall was really, really helpful to clean up a lot of the fears that we had with people who were not willing to tap hard for giants. So I wanted to point that out because I think mm. this is an example of where your principles really shine through, you know? And then on that, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say. So uh, uh, an excellent drill is just to change the top bar for a metal bar, mm -hmm. leave the low bar, low rail as it is. Maybe chuck a mat over it just to pad it up a little bit and get the athlete to sw just literally swing backwards and forwards, passing the low bar, looking at mm -hmm. it each time. They can straddle and then close their legs each time they pass the bar, whether it's on the way up or on the way down. Um, and that's really going to help them to understand the exact location of the bar in relation to their swing. And it's just giving you the opportunity to get those reps in. So, I'm a, you know, I'm a big fan of doing that. And here's the crucial bit, Dave. I'm a big fan of doing that with already accomplished athletes. Right. You know, these basic exercises in inverted commas are not, not reserved for your youngest kids that haven't learned the skills yet. They're important for everybody in order to maintain swing, improve swing, further develop develop swing and so essentially the very highest level bar workers will be the very best at swinging that's because they've invested time in it it's not mm. always just by chance right um yeah success is not is not often by by accident it's very deliberate particularly when it's coming to something as technical as, as what bars is so mm. um it's important that the listeners understand that there's always a time to do this Mm. And where do you stand on, um, you, you brought up straddling versus straight body. You know, I've seen some coaches that, um, are straight body from a very young age and they kind of really are, are adamant about that, but then the athlete grows and it starts to get really sketchy with like piking their, their swings. And then they try to straddle their giants and they have to relearn how to swing. And there's other coaches that I think uh, not in maybe the elite world, but in some, but they're just like, they get a little taller. We'll just move the bars out, get a little taller, move the bars out. Right. And then maybe they're in a more loose competitive setting, but then that athlete goes to try to do a shoot over and the bar looks like it's eight miles away. Right. Versus having a nice closing, like bail to handstand, something like that. So I don't know. I've never asked this before, but where do you, are do you always teach legs together and then straddle as you need or start with straddle or what are your thoughts there? Yeah. So the teaching process would always begin with legs together, like just a straight body, um, because more often than not you're teaching swings and, and giants, of course, to kids, you know, the seven, eight, nine years old. Yeah. Um, I take a pretty proactive approach to straddling. So I would work on straddle swings and straddle giants before the athlete needs them. Mm. And by need them, I mean that they're not tall enough yet oh, to hit yeah. the low bar because you want them to not think of it as a reactive, like, 
oh, you're getting tall. You're going to hit the low bar soon. And that, and that's, that can be an issue. Now, in Britain and potentially most of Europe, it, we don't adjust the bars like you do in the States. So we don't yeah. go mega wide like you can do at NCAA and I don't know, maybe level 10s. I'm not clued up enough as to what you do. But in the UK, we stick to FIG, yeah. um, to my knowledge still, at least anyway. And so we are, you know, much more likely to have to adapt as opposed to ignore the fact that the athlete has grown and um but you know ultimately a straddle is designed to make the body shorter so Mm. that's essentially what we're trying to do and therefore it allows us to keep the hips flatter which again is going to improve shape and swing never thought about that's very that's a very wise shortness yeah i didn't thought about that yeah if you the way that i illustrate this to an athlete if you get them to lie down on the floor uh in a handstand position so with their legs together and then you just draw a chalk line where their hands are and their toes are and then you ask them to straddle their legs and then you now draw where their toes are again they will notice that their body has reduced in length and that's ultimately what we're trying to achieve of course is just to to put them in a safer distance but um straddling could also allow for um a different timing of the swing it allows the athlete to be able to generate a more fluid swing so it's not just about avoiding the low bar it's about creating the most fluid um and useful swing efficient swing essentially that's going to help us with the mm-hmm. uh, you know whatever skill is co- it's coming coming next yeah and we're already here so what are your thoughts on over the bar tapping because i know that's a very common elite strategy to maybe have a, a bigger tool toolkit of, of skills to possibly do you know to have an extremely early tap which is obviously tapping over the bar is like the way end of the curve compared to you know tapping uh, straddling when you're a younger compulsory yeah, so I would I only do this in two examples. One would be uh, a dismount, a high level dismount, mm-hmm. and the other one would be uh, Takachev. So, and in and in, in not in all cases, so there will be some kids that will do a Takachev with the feet down in between the bar still, and the same for the dismount. Mm-hmm. But I would be happy to use an over the bar tap for those skills, particularly right. Takachev, because it's for me it generates the most amount of uh, amplitude and and swing. Um, there's a safety aspect involved with dismounts that I'm, I'm like super wary of that because I've seen yeah. so many dismounts go wrong yeah. and it's just something, you know, not just the flyaways, but when you're, you're stepping into the world of, of, you know, back in full outs and, uh, you know, double pike dismounts, we really do have to consider safety here and making sure yeah. that the athlete is a, is a comfortable, consistent, safe distance away from the bar. So there's sometimes if I, if I'm not able to trust that the athlete can do that safely, I will take a point one deduction on the knees with them hanging over the top of the bar yeah. because you just got to weigh it up and go, well, yeah. you know, there's n- first of all, there's nothing more important than safety. And mm. two, if I can guarantee almost that the athlete is going to be in a, in a consistent position release, but the cost of that is just a one tenth deduction over the low bar, then, right. you know, there's a good chance I'm going to take that. Mm. Yeah. And that's a really good transition to, you know, I, I, I was tra- trying to go under an hour, but we talked about fishing and dogs. So I'm going to count that in our buffer time for my fault. But um, I think it leads to the ne- the last kind of big category that many people have some challenges with. And we're already dancing around this, which is dismounts, right? And I think, mm-hmm. again, this is just a really good example of why principles of, I mean, vision for sure is probably the, the biggest one, no pun intended, eye opener that you taught me, which is if you're not very clearly looking at your toes or understanding where your eyes and ears should be covered, it's very easy to break your shoulder angle and come into the bar. And so like, that's one huge reason why people do pull in or hit the bar and get fear. And then the other is understanding the timing and the amplitude of a tap, right? And so for a lot of athletes that I had worked with after learning from you, and they were terrified of doing a layout even or a double back, I would be like, well, why do you hit the bar? Right. And they're like, well, I actually don't know. Like, okay, well, tell me what you think would do it. Like, well, I guess if I close my shoulders, right. Or if I just tapped at the wrong time or I didn't tap at all, and then you can reverse engineer, like, well, what are some cues you could use to prevent that? Well, I could definitely look at my toes. I could keep my ears covered. I could make sure I tap and behind when I see my feet, right. Things like that. And then you build that out to drills that support that principle you're trying to enforce. And that has cleared up a lot of mental blocks on flyaways for me as, as people being able to really technically understand that. Um, and so I, I hope I didn't just steal your thunder, but it's kind of is your thunder because you taught me that. But um, yeah, I'd just like to riff on dismounts a little bit and, and kind of the fear aspect people get. Yeah. Um, and so if we think about the progression of skills, we've talked about many of them today. We start with the ability to swing correctly, then that's going to lead to the ability to giant correctly. And then that's going to lead to being able to to fly effectively, essentially, you know, do a, do a dismount. Um, so, you know, it's always worth going backwards and, and saying, you know, is the swing correct? You know, are they visual? Have they got control mm. of the body? Do mm. we see that same level of control in the giants? Um, you know, is the swing consistent and the timing of the tap? And can we now adopt that with um, a dismount as well? So, yeah, what's, I guess, like the kip, what's really important here is repetition. 
mm. uh, safe, consistent repetition, and the athlete just needs to feel like they're in control. That's what confidence feels like. I'm in mm. control of my body. I know how to move this away from the bar. I know how to increase or decrease height. Now that right. level of understanding of a skill is only going to come from good technique. Right. You know, so if you're if you're doing, you know, five or six candlesticks and then you're expecting to flip the kids over and that they're going to be able to um, you know, do that dismount effectively and consistently, mm -mm, it's not happening. Mm -hmm. But you need hundreds of repetitions a week and i want to jump in here and kind of be just yeah. tough love which is if your hand like there's a place for hand spotting and helping kids learn that are young but yeah. if you're hand spotting and double spotting every single drill and every single flyaway dismount they're not learning they're not building that confidence you're talking about with their swing and with their shaping and with their vision they're waiting for you to keep them from their shins hitting the bar so like i'm a big fan of you've taught me is like really like independent drills can be done, you know, at, yeah. a, at a very young age. Sorry. So yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and again, that's where the confidence is going to come from. So I think that's, I think that's key. Um, but just, you know, having the coaches be super patient and proactive. So if the, if the kid needs a flyaway at 10, you want to be starting that, uh, at nine years old, you know, you want that year mm. invested into the skill as opposed to thinking, Oh, we, you know, we've ticked this level. We need to move on now. Let's start the flyaways. And we've got three months to do it because you're just adding pressure and yeah. making life hard for yourself like some of these skills need a serious investment of time not only because you want a consistent skill but that flyaway is super important that's going to lead to a ginger potentially a double back um you know it, there's there's other skills which come from it so i believe that um consistency there's important safety yeah they do need to do a lot of spotted still so i think it's about getting that balance right but I would suggest that the listeners just sort of reflect on four. I'm just going to pick four skills here, Dave. Mm. Okay. So they can do like a little audit of their bar preparation work. Let's get the coaches looking at their kids' handstands. So literally just doing, ask them to do a 30 second kick to handstand on, the, on a hard floor and remove all your bias about what you believe that gymnast can do. Just look at that handstand. Is it balanced? Is it in the correct position? Are the arms completely straight? Are they extended? Can you see the ears? Just take it for what it is. Take a photo of it and see what that handstand looks like. That's one skill. The next one's going to be a back extension roll to handstand or a backward roll to handstand, as we would say. Okay. If the athlete can't do that without exposing their ribs, so basically moving that, you know, opening their chest, uh, exposing their ears, arching their back, you know, all those sorts of things. If they can't do it without, without, Oh, am I getting this right the way I'm saying this? They need to be able to do that correctly, Dave, which is what yeah. I'm saying. <laughs> okay, so um, if they're opening their chest or, or bending their arms or sticking their head out, then the preparation work is just not right at that stage. Fix mm. it, work on it. The next thing is going to be looking at their swing. How mm. high do they swing? How consistently do they swing? What are the shapes that they're showing? And the final one is going to be a candlestick dismount release position. Okay, supported. So, you know, taking the wrists or, or however the coaches want to spot that. Um, so just kind of do a little basic audit of those four elements. If I was to add one more in there, it would be a soul circle, like a toe circle mm. where they keep the feet on. They just do sort of five or six in a row. And again, I'm looking for great shape, smooth kind of shift. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Um, so smooth shift of the wrists, absolute straight arms, keeping the ears covered, all the same qualities we want in a backward giant. That's why those toe circles or monkey giants are so important. So those would be kind of the five basic fundamental skills that I'd ask the athlete to um, ask the athlete to perform. And you've just got to strip away all your bias and just go like, where are we at? Like, really, where are we at? Mm. And because uh, a handstand hold and a back extension roll to handstand will tell me most of what I need to know about an athlete's level of preparation. They don't even mm. need to get on the bar. Yeah. And that and that's not because I'm amazing or anything like that. It's because those skills are such key indicators of preparation. Yeah. And only a kid that's been prepared properly will be able to do a back backward roll to handstand with their ribs in, without moving the head you know, keeping their, uh, their ears covered with absolute straight arms. There's a serious amount of preparation that goes into that. And that will tell mm. you all that you need to know. Have you ever heard when people say that you can judge the quality of a restaurant by the uh, cleanliness of the toilets? I have not heard that. I well, have heard that it is the, uh, the quality or the, um, the cleanliness of the tablecloths. That's what I've heard. Interesting. Well, you're wrong and I'm right. Okay. It's about <laughs> the cleanliness of the toilets. And I always think about that analogy when I'm explaining like the best way of understanding the quality of your bar work will be looking at a back extension roller handstand. Like that's just, that's your skill. That's your indicator. Okay. 
we're gonna we're gonna keep that analogy right where it is and move on. <laughs> <laughs> um, the last point I wanted to make before we uh, probably banter for two more hours and I skip my next podcast is um, I think it's really important what you said, which is that the the year in advance you want to be trying to thinking about these things. And here in the states, the progression of really young athletes like they they first do like an all low bar compulsory, then they eventually jump to the high bar, and like that is such a golden opportunity to really drill these principles and these foundations. Cause like the kids that are doing slow bar kips, like they're like five sometimes, right? They're like barely, barely yep. present, right? But when they start to get mature enough where they're jumping to the high bar, it's such a scary point for them. But like that can be ears covered. Are you looking at the bar? Are you extending as long as you possibly can? Like hmm. really good hollow shape we work on. Like that's not complex. Like you said, that's just a basic understanding of fundamentals, but ingraining that when they're six or when they're seven and they jump becomes do you really keep those ears covered when you tap hard you really they have a, a half turn dismount here at one of our levels yeah so like you really understand that long kick swing half turn and like really keeping the ears covered same vision because mm -hmm. that then becomes when you do your first flyaway drill when you do your first shoulder stand do you have the same exact principles map there and we could make that argument for that girl who's gonna be in 10 years doing a super powerful uh laid out full out right and she's a college athlete or an elite athlete like it's literally the same thing she learned when she was jumping to the high bar when she was six yeah. right and i think that's just such a, a really good way to maybe wrap this up and thread that needle through all the principles we talked about from the the biggest picture of the two we talked about which is principles of all coaching to bar ideas down to like specific nitty-gritty drills you know mm. yep i completely agree Fantastic. You can you could be introducing those principles at a, a super young age, like yeah. even like doing a forward roll on the floor. You can start talking about where they should totally. be looking and, totally. and co covering their ears and things like that. So yeah, that's going to be that's going to be key. And because you're embedding it in when they're young, they're more likely to transfer that throughout their their entire sort of skill acquisition journey. So mm -hmm. yeah, good stuff, great, David. Man. Good stuff. Yeah, and we this is like literally the tip of the iceberg for bars. And thankfully, this is a segue. Um, when this one comes out, actually, it will be the week that we announced the symposium. And uh, you know, we we tried to shuffle up a lot of the the presenters to get a lot more people involved but i felt like whether it's friendship or whether it's just because you're, you're a wealth of knowledge um i wanted to have you back on to do bar lectures so i feel like two of the more exciting lectures are going to be your circling and in bar lecture and then we're actually going to do a lecture on giants and dismounts and so yeah if you didn't think you had enough drills and things to work on now uh <laughs> we come to the next lecture and you're gonna have a whole boatload you know what i mean so I, I know you probably haven't gotten all the way through creating these things but um are you are you particularly interested in sharing anything for those lectures that you can tease well, we're certainly going to be uh, bringing some of the concepts and principles that we've talked about in this episode to life so people will be able to see them visually. So, yeah. you know, breaking down what those drills look like, um, seeing the actual learning models visually, whether that's the, uh, you know, five principles of bars, for example, we'll talk mm. about my optimization tool. These are all learning concepts, which are super important for us to, 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 to develop as coaches, really. Mm. So, um, yeah, bring it to life visually and sharing some of those uh, yeah, great exercises. It just always helps connect the dots, doesn't it, between the theory and and then practice so yeah very much looking forward to, to join you again for another great symposium and it'll be amazing yeah and i remember last year uh, i shared some of the notes with you but i think people really enjoyed the blend of the high level philosophy that went down to like specific because last year you did twisting and front and back and people yeah. were like i see all the acrobatic principles but now i see exactly where that shows up in this whip half drill or this back half roll drill on a resi and i think there was a lot of really good positive feedback of you know i've, I've been to some lectures where it's just like all up in the clouds and i've been to other lectures they show you 74 drills and they rip through it real fast and you're like kind of lost on either side so yeah, just kudos to you because I think you do a really good job of maybe blending uh, a little bit of both of that. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Pleasure, my friend. Well, I am excited to, uh, yeah, get ready for the symposium and, and make all my lectures as well and have you there again. So uh, thank you for your uh, your hour of time that we had here. And uh, are there any other hobby stories or things you want to talk about before we, you know, bore the listeners more with a send off? Or are you okay? <laughs> I think I'm okay for now. <laughs> we'll leave on a high instead. <laughs> Yeah, but thanks good. for everyone who's who's got this far in the episode and has chosen to to, to stay. Appreciate yeah, it. I'm gonna timestamp the actual bar content and the other twenty minutes. On oh gosh, that are... <laughs> good times. Good, good times. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it.